Welcome to ChemHelp ASAP. Let's perform a demonstration of an aromatization reaction. This particular aromatization relies on an elimination of water from a molecule to form an aromatic ring. The video description contains links to supporting documents, including the laboratory procedure and proton NMR spectra. Here is a type of aromatization reaction. We start with a ring that is close to being aromatic. It has two pi bonds, just one more, and we will form a benzene ring with all the stability that comes with it. The way we're going to make this ring aromatic is through an oxidation with MnO2, manganese dioxide. This reagent is known for oxidizing carbons next to a double bond, the allylic position. Once an alcohol is formed over here, if the molecule loses water through an elimination, we form the aromatic product. Most aromatizations work in exactly this manner. A ring is likely one pi bond away from being aromatic, and then some kind of elimination occurs to form the pi bond and generate the aromatic ring. Here is our specific reaction. We are starting with this rather exotic molecule on the left. This is a product that can be made through a Diels Alder cycloaddition we showed in a different video. In this product, we have a six-membered ring hidden within the structure. The ring has one pi bond. If we can get two more, we can generate an aromatic molecule. How can we aromatize this product? If you notice, this molecule contains two carbonyls, one from the acid and one from the amide. Both of these carbonyls enhance the acidity of the alpha hydrogens with enough of a strong base, like KOH, we can form the enolate next to the amide. The enolate will then eliminate the OR group at the beta carbon. That will form a new pi bond. If we do the same elimination from the enolate next to the acid, then we get a second pi bond and ultimately form the product on the right. I'm ignoring the acidity of the carboxylic acid. That acid will certainly be deprotonated, but with enough heat, we'll be able to drive the reaction to form the aromatic product. This exact elimination and aromatization was published in the literature back in 2012. It's a great reaction. Fast, high yielding, and clean. Let's see how it works. Well, let's get started with this experiment and dispense some reagents. I have pre-weighed some material. So this is the this is the starting material for the reaction. This is the, um, the cycloaddict from the intramolecular Diels Alder. And that is right about 500 milligrams. It's like 502 milligrams. And so based on the calculations, we need 10 equivalents of KOH. Well, based on 500 milligrams of the cycloaddict, 10 equivalents is going to be about 17 and a half millimoles. And that is about 980 milligrams. So here I have a small beaker with some KOH. KOH is kind of a pain to weigh out accurately because each, that little piece weighs 140 milligrams. So it's hard to be super precise. We're not going to worry about being super precise. We just need at least 980 milligrams. So that's already 500 milligrams. There's a big piece. That's, I mean, this is just fascinating viewing, I'm sure, to watch this get weighed out piece by piece. That's 870. One more. Oh, hey, that's pretty close. That's 993 or 94. We'll call it 993 milligrams. So we're going to take this. We're going to put it into a 20 milliliter scintillation vial. Quickly, because um, KOH and sodium hydroxide as well, they, they pretty quickly absorb moisture and actually sodium uh, carbon dioxide from the air. So you want to try to keep it 
under wraps quickly. Okay, so good. So that is, uh, that's our amount of KOH. Now we can go in the hood and begin preparing the solutions and get things ready for this reaction. So fantastic. Here we are in the hood. Here is our vial with nearly a gram of KOH in it. And we're going to dissolve this into some uh, uh, one propanol. So that's about seven milliliters of one propanol. And our goal is to create a 15% weight by volume solution of KOH in one propanol. And I'm going to throw a stir bar in here to help this out. I'm going to gently place a cap on this vial, but we are going to heat this. And you don't want to heat things up that are sealed. You start heating sealed glass vials, and um, you've created a little bomb. So I will engage the threads, but that's definitely loose. I'm going to put this into a sand bath that's at about 120 degrees. Now I should say that's the hot plate is warming up to 120 degrees. The sand bath won't get up that hot. We just need this hot enough to dissolve our KOH. So this is now stirring. It's getting warm. It is dissolving the KOH. And once this is a fully dissolved solution, then we'll be able to go ahead and put our cycloaddict from a previous experiment in there and we can begin this aromatization reaction. All right, this has gotten pretty hot. Everything has dissolved. Again, the cap is on, but it's very loose, so we're not building up any pressure. So now, um, since all the KOH has dissolved, let's go ahead and add in, I wanna break that piece a little bit. Add in our material. Are those pieces going to go in. Well, we got a little technical problem here. Let's let that stir. I need to break up a piece here, make it smaller. Crunch. Okay, let's see what that does. Okay, much better. Oh boy, that was not supposed to be so exciting. Okay, loosely capped. Get it down into the bottom of the sand bath where all the heat is. And now we will let this stir. We'll let this stir for 15 or 20 minutes. And that will actually complete the reaction. So this, this is uh, quite a short reaction, but we'll let it go ahead and heat and see what happens. Well, this has been stirring for probably closer to 30 minutes than 15 minutes. And everything looks nicely dissolved. It is stirring. Um, Hey, that looks great. So we're going to let this cool down because we're going to have to manipulate this a little bit, uh, transfer, add water and acid to it. So we'll let this cool down and uh, get close to room temperature, and then we will start the final process and work towards isolating our product. So great. We have several things now with us. We have some water in a beaker. Here is our mixture. It's cooled down very nicely. It's our reaction mixture. And we're going to go ahead and transfer our reaction mixture into this beaker. Nothing dramatic is going to happen yet, but we're just diluting this in water. So remember, our reaction is in propanol, and so that mixes with water just fine. We still have plenty of base in here, so we use a little bit of water. Try to rinse this out. Again, that's 30 milliliters of water. And our reaction is just dumped in there. Okay, hopefully that's a pretty good transfer. We're going to set that aside. We're done with that. Now, this stir bar, this poor little stir bar, is trying to mix all this volume. I think it's doing okay. Now, we, we want to neutralize this. Right now, our molecule is present as... Um, as a deprotonated form, it's a carboxylate, and to get our compound to precipitate, we need to protonate it. To do that, we're going to mix it with some sulfuric acid. So this solution right here is a mixture of uh, it's six molar sulfuric acid, so it's pretty concentrated. So I'm going to add some of this 
course, any time you, you work with concentrated acids, you want to be careful. And I'm going to add this in dropwise. And as I dr add it in, we're going to neutralize some of the base in the reaction. But then uh, we'll find out that there's an excess of base. And that precipitate will go away because it reacts with the rest of the base in the solution. So really we're doing a titration. We're trying to neutralize all of this base with this six molar sulfuric acid. So I will add this. I'll go a little bit faster so it doesn't take forever. But there's in the end we're going to have to check and make sure that we've adjusted the pH of this solution. And there's no reason to even check the pH until we see a persistent precipitate forming. And as you can see we're not quite there yet. But we're making progress. And I'll add a little bit faster We're close to getting there now. This stir bar is just so weak. Let's give it a little hand. Let's add some more. It, it won't hurt things if we go past the end point. But of course, I don't want to check it until we have a chance. Okay, so that, I've added a fair amount of acid now. Now, let's check the pH of our solution. And hopefully, it's had a good chance to mix there. So there is a piece of sheet of pH paper. I'm just going to touch it, get a drop out of here and touch it to the pH paper and you can see that is a nice red color on the pH paper. We don't want to dip the pH paper into solution. We want to take an aliquot out and put it to the pH paper. So this is definitely nice and acidic. Now let's roll it around just a bit more and a beaker is not the easiest piece of glassware to do that in, but let, let's just double check. Let, so sometimes you check a pH and you just happen to hit part of your solution that is happens to be not fully mixed in. But okay, that's two samples, two acidic points. This looks pretty good. So we're going to let this stir, make sure everything has a chance to precipitate out, and then we'll come back and do a filtration. Oh boy, let's go. Let's do a filtration. We have a filter flask set up with a sidearm to the vacuum, a Buchner funnel, and a rubber adapter. I'm going to turn on that vacuum. And there's a filter paper in there. And we're filtering. This is our solution of our uh, product in water. And since it's water, we'll just seat the filter paper with some water. And always take a peek in there make sure it's sealing up everything. Okay, that looks great. Now let's give this a gentle swirl to suspend that solid and just pour this material right on through. Great, nice and frothy. And now we'll take a little bit of water and just rinse this down. That looks great. Not a ton. Awesome. There goes a stir bar. Let's just go with the rest. This is like 10 milliliters of water total. I think that's plenty. And that is it. So we'll now just need to let this air dry. And once this is air dried, we can scrape it off the filter paper, put it on a teared watch glass, and we'll find out the mass of our dry isolated, crude, yet hopefully clean, recovered product. Well, all right, now we have um, spread this material out on a watch glass. It is, it has had a chance to air dry fully. And the final mass of material is 353 milligrams, which is not super high, but I think that's going to be a completely reasonable yield for this reaction. So. As always, we see these beautiful solids and it looks fairly colorless, which is what most small organic molecules are. And it looks pretty clean, but we'll have to take a peek at the, uh, the characterization data, the NMR, maybe a TLC, maybe a melting point, and just see if the data back up what appears to be a fairly acceptable product. So let's, let's take a look at all that data. Let's determine our reaction yield. The reaction requires our starter material and a lot of base. We used 
502 milligrams of the starter material with a molecular weight of 285 grams per mole, that is 1.76 millimoles of starting material. We have a bunch of base, 933 milligrams at a molecular weight of 56 grams per mole for 17.7 millimoles. That is 10 equivalents of KOH, a large excess relative to our other starter material and exactly what the procedure required. From a yield perspective, the non-aromatic starting material determines our yield. So 1.76 millimoles is our theoretical yield. How much product did we get? We got 353 milligrams. Our product has a molecular weight of 267 grams per mole. That's 18 less than the starting material and reflects a loss of water with mass of 18. The number of millimoles is 1.32. That is our actual yield. For percent yield, we take actual over theoretical times 100. That gives us a percent yield of 75. 75%. That's quite nice. Of course, we need to make sure the material is reasonably clean before we celebrate and pat ourselves on the back too much. On the screen is an image of the TLC plate of the product. The mobile phase is 100%. Ethyl acetate. The spots for the product have traveled 2.2 centimeters up the plate. The solvent front traveled 4 centimeters. That gives an RF value of 0.55. The TLC looks promising. Just one spot. How about the melting range? The material made through this reaction had it observed melting range of 177 to 178.5 degrees Celsius. The literature value taken from our reference is a bit higher at 183 to 185. While these are not the exact same, the melting ranges are close enough to not raise any serious alarm. Here is the full NMR spectrum for our product. Nothing particularly stands out. The product definitely looks clean based on the lack of spurious peaks in the baseline, maybe just a speck here and there. This peak all the way down around 16 ppm is a bit unusual, but we can make sense of that. Here is the carboxylic acid peak. Acids are normally in the 10 to 13 ppm range, but this one is almost at 16 ppm. That's a big jump. The OH of the acid is likely interacting with the amide carbonyl through an intramolecular hydrogen bond to cause the downfield shift of this signal. This type of hydrogen bond does affect the electronic environment of the hydrogen and therefore it affects the chemical shift as well. Now let's look at the aromatic region. The five proton multiplet on the right side is at about 7.4 ppm. And that is from the five hydrogens on the benzyl group. These generally fall in roughly the same place in a spectrum. The remaining three hydrogens are on the aromatic ring. Let's draw them in, H, A, B, and C. Which hydrogen gives which signal? 
I'm not completely sure, but the triplet at 7.8 ppm would be the middle hydrogen, HB, with its two neighbors. The two doublets are HA and HC. I would guess that HA is at 8.2 ppm because of the electron withdrawing nature of the carboxylic acid and HC is closer to 7.9 ppm. There isn't much left to this spectrum. The remaining peaks are the two CH2 groups. Let's label one as HD and the other as HE. Again, I have to guess which is which. I'll assign HD as a signal at 4.9 ppm and that leaves HE as likely being at 4.6 ppm. Before wrapping up this experiment, I do want to compare the NMR spectra of the starter material to the product. Here they are, the starting material is on top and the product is on the bottom. Both spectra were taken with DMSO as a solvent. Let's mark those solvent peaks, both DMSO and water. Note that the DMSO signal in the top spectrum overlaps with one of the hydrogens in the molecule. So we can't completely ignore the signal on the far right. Here are our two peaks for water. I think there are two big ideas that can be seen by comparing these spectra. One is the aromatic region. The other is the overall complexity of the spectra due to stereochemistry. Let's look at the starter material in the alkene region. So we have two peaks here, two alkene signals from these two hydrogens. In the product, these, air, these alkene signals become aromatic ring hydrogens and they move downfield. And note that the CH next to the oxygen, which appears about 5 ppm, also becomes aromatic and actually jumps down to about 8 ppm. Now let's look at the complexity of the spectra. The starting material has two more hydrogens in the product but the spectrum on top is far busier. It looks like a lot more than just two hydrogens, the difference of a water molecule. An important factor is that the top molecule has multiple stereocenters. In a molecule with stereocenters, some CH2 groups may not appear as expected. Look at the ring CH2 in the starting material. These two hydrogens show up in different places because the up hydrogen is in a different environment than the down hydrogen because of the stereochemistry. These same two hydrogens, so let's circle those hydrogens, those two hydrogens in the box, those same two hydrogens become a singlet in the product and move down to about 5 ppm. So these two hydrogens appear as a singlet because there's no longer stereochemistry in the molecule. The stereo centers in the product are gone, flattened out as the ring became aromatic. That CH2 is now a simple singlet and so therefore the number of signals goes down even though the number of hydrogens is still the same for that, those particular signals. One final comment. NMR is often less about determining an unknown structure and more about anticipating changes that occur as one molecule transforms into another. You generally know what the starting material NMR looks like and then decide whether the product NMR represents a reasonable change based on what happened to the molecule structure. I hope you enjoyed seeing this aromatization reaction. Check out the video description for links to the procedure and NMR spectra. Please subscribe, like, or leave a comment. Take care.